That night, the Baudelaire children sat at the table with Aunt Josephine and ate their dinner with a cold pit in their stomachs. Half of the pit came from the chilled lime stew that Aunt Josephine had prepared, but the other half, if not more than half, came from the knowledge that Count Olaf was in their lives once again. That Captain Sham is certainly a charming person, Aunt Josephine said, putting a piece of lime rind into her mouth. He must be very lonely, moving to a new town and losing a leg. Maybe we could have him over for dinner. We keep trying to tell you, Aunt Josephine, Violet said, pushing the stew around on her plate so it would look like she'd eaten more than she actually had. He's not Captain Sham. He's Count Olaf in disguise. I have had enough of this nonsense, Aunt Josephine said. Mr. Poe told me that Count Olaf has a tattoo on his left ankle and one eyebrow over his eyes. Captain Sham doesn't have a left ankle and only has one eye. I cannot believe you would dare to disagree with a man who has eye problems. I have eye problems, Klaus said, pointing to his glasses. And you're disagreeing with me. I will thank you not to be impertinent, Aunt Josephine said, using a word which here means pointing out that I am wrong, which annoys me. It is very annoying. You will have to accept, once and for all, that Captain Sham is not Count Olaf. She reached into her pocket and pulled out the business card. Look at this card. Does it say Count Olaf? No, it says Captain Sham. The card does have a serious grammatical error to it, but it is nevertheless proof that Count Captain Sham is who he says he is. Aunt Josephine put the business card down on the dinner table, and the Baudelaire's looked at it and sighed. Business cards, of course, are not proof of anything. Anyone can go to a print shop and have cards made that say anything they like. The King of Denmark can order business cards that says he sells golf balls. Your dentist can order business cards that say she is your grandmother. In order to escape from the castle of an enemy of mine, I once had cards printed that said I was an admiral in the French Navy. Just because something is typed, whether it is typed on a business card or typed in a newspaper or book, this does not mean that it is true. The three siblings were well aware of this simple fact, but could not find the words to convince Aunt Josephine. So, they merely looked at Aunt Josephine, sighed, and silently pretended to eat their stew. It was so quiet in the dining room that everyone jumped. Violet, Klaus, Sonny, and even Aunt Josephine, when the telephone rang. My goodness! Aunt Josephine said. What should we do? Minka! Sonny shrieked, which probably meant something like, Answer it, of course! Aunt Josephine stood up from the table, but didn't move even as the phone rang a second time. It might be important, she said, but I don't know if it's worth the risk of electrocution. If it makes you feel more comfortable... Violet said, wiping her mouth with her napkin. I'll answer the phone. Violet stood up and walked to the phone in time to answer it on the third ring. Hello? She asked. Is this Mrs. Anne Whistle? A wheezy voice asked. No, Violet replied. This is Violet Baudelaire. May I help you? Put the old woman on the phone. Phone orphan, the voice said, and Violet froze, recognizing it was Captain Sham. Quickly, she stole a glance at Aunt Josephine, who was now watching Violet nervously. I'm sorry, Violet said into the phone. You must have the wrong number. Don't play with me, you wretched girl, Captain Sham started to say, but Violet hung up the phone 
her heart pounding, and turned to Aunt Josephine. Someone was asking for the Hop Along Dancing School, she said, lying quickly. I told them they had the wrong number. What a brave girl you are, Aunt Josephine murmured. Picking up the phone like that? It's actually very safe, Violet said. Haven't you ever answered the phone, Aunt Josephine? Klaus asked. I almost always answered it, Aunt Josephine said. And he used a special glove for safety. But now that I've seen you answer it, maybe I'll give it a try next time somebody calls. The phone rang, and Aunt Josephine jumped again. Goodness! I didn't think it would ring again so soon! <laughs> what an adventurous evening! Violet stared at the phone, knowing it was Captain Sham calling back. Would you like me to answer it again? She asked. No, no, Aunt Josephine said, walking toward the small ringing phone, as if it were a big barking dog. I said I'd try it, and I will! She took a deep breath, reached out a nervous hand, and picked up the phone. Hello, she said. Yes, this is she. Oh, hello, Captain Shep. How lovely to hear your voice. Aunt Josephine listened for a moment and then blushed bright red. Oh, well, oh, that's very nice of you to say, Captain Sham, but... Uh, what? What? Oh, uh, all right. That's very nice of you to say, Julio. What? Oh, what a lovely idea, but uh, do please hold on one moment. Aunt Josephine held a hand over the receiver end, facing the children. Violet Klaus Sunny, uh, please go to your room, she said. Captain Sham, I mean Julio, has asked me to call him by his first name. Is planning a surprise for you children. He wants to discuss it with me. We don't want a surprise, Klaus said. Of course you do, Aunt Josephine said. Now, run along so I can discuss it without your eavesdropping. We're not eavesdropping, Violet said. But I think it'd be better if we stayed here. Perhaps you are confused about the meaning of the word eavesdropping, Aunt Josephine said. It means listening in. If you stay here, you will be eavesdropping. Please go to your room. We know what eavesdropping means, Klaus said. But he followed his sisters down the hallway to their room. Once inside, they looked at one another in silent frustration. Violet put aside pieces of the toy caboose that she had planned to examine that evening to make room on her bed for the three of them to lie beside one another and frown at the ceiling. I thought we'd be safe here, Violet said glumly. I thought that anybody who was friend of realtors would never be friendly to Count Olaf, no matter how he is disguised. Do you think he actually let leeches chew off his leg? Klaus wondered, shuddering. Just to hide his tattoo? Join! Sunny shrieked, which probably meant, That seems a little drastic, even for Count Olaf! I agree with Sunny, Violet said. I think he told that tale about leeches just to make Aunt Josephine feel sorry for him. And it sure worked, Klaus said, sighing. After he told her that sob story, she fell for his disguise hook, line, and sinker. At least she isn't as, as trusting as Uncle Monty, Violet pointed out. He let Count Olaf move right into the house. At least then we would keep an eye on him, Klaus replied. Uber, Sunny remarked, which meant something along the lines of, Although we still didn't save Uncle Monty... What do you think he's up to this time? Violet asked. Maybe he plans to take us out on one of his boats and drown us in the lake. Maybe he wants us to push this whole house off the mountain, Klaus said, and blame it on Hurricane Herman. Have to, 
Sunny said glumly, which probably meant something like, Maybe he wants to put the lacrimose leeches in our beds. Maybe, 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 Violet said. All these maybes won't get us anywhere. We could call Mr. Poe and tell him Count Olaf is here, Klaus said. Maybe he could come and fetch us. That's the biggest maybe of all time, Violet said. It's almost impossible to convince Mr. Poe of anything, and Aunt Josephine doesn't believe us, even though we saw Count Olaf with her own eyes. She doesn't even think she saw Count Olaf, Klaus agreed sadly. She thinks she saw Captain Sham. Sonny nibbled half-heartedly on Pretty Penny's head and muttered, Pah! Which probably meant, You mean Julio! Then I don't see what we can do, Klaus said, except keep our eyes and ears open. Duma, Sonny agreed. You're both right, Violet said. We'll just have to keep a very careful watch. The Baudelaire orphans nodded solemnly, but the cold pit in their stomachs had not gone away. They all felt that keeping watch wasn't really much of a plan for defending themselves from Captain Sham, and as it grew later and later, it worried them more and more. Violet tied her hair up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes, as if she were inventing something, but she thought and thought for hours and hours, and was unable to invent another plan. Klaus stared at the ceiling with the utmost concentration, as if something very interesting were written on it, but nothing helpful occurred to him as the hour grew later and later. And Sunny bit Pretty Penny's head over and over, but no matter how long she bit it, she couldn't think of anything to ease the Baudelaire's worries. I have a friend named Gina Sue who is a socialist, and Gina Sue had a favorite saying. You can't lock up the barn after the horses are gone. It means simply that sometimes even the best of plans will occur to you when it is too late. This, I'm sorry to say, is the case with the Baudelaire orphans and their plan to keep a close watch on Captain Sham. For after hours and hours of worrying, they heard an enormous crash of shattering glass and knew at once that keeping watch hadn't been a good enough plan. What was that noise? Violet said, getting up off the bed. It sounded like breaking glass, Klaus said worriedly, walking toward the bedroom door. This do! Sunny shrieked, but her siblings did not have time to figure out what she meant as they all hurried down the hallway. Aunt Josephine! Aunt Josephine! Violet called, but there was no answer. She peered up and down the hallway, but everything was quiet. Aunt Josephine! She called again. Violet led the way as the three orphans ran into the dining room, but the guardian wasn't there either. The candles on the table were still lit, casting a flickering glow on the business card and the bowls of cold lime stew. Aunt Josephine! Violet called again, and the children ran back out of the hallway and toward the door of the library. As she ran, Violet couldn't help but remember how she and her siblings had called Uncle Monty's name early one morning, just before discovering the tragedy that had befallen him. Aunt Josephine, she called. She couldn't help but remember all the time she had woken up in the middle of the night, calling out the names of her parents as she dreamed, as she so often did, of the terrible fire that had claimed their lives. Aunt Josephine, she said, reaching the library door. Violet was afraid she was calling out Aunt Josephine's name when her aunt could no longer hear it. Look, Klaus said and pointed at the door. A piece of paper, folded in half, was attached to the wood with a thumbtack. Klaus pried the paper loose and unfolded it. What is it? Violet asked, and Sunny craned her little neck to see. It's a note, Klaus said, and read it out loud. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny, by the time you read this note, my life will be at its end. 
My heart is as cold as Ike, and I find life unbearable. I know your children may not understand the sad life of a dowager, but or what would have land leaded me to this desperate act. But please know that I am much happier this way. As my last will and testament, I leave you three in the care of Captain Sham, a kind and honorable man. Please think of me kindly, even though I've done this terrible thing. Your Aunt Josephine. Oh no, Klaus said quietly when he was finished reading. He turned the piece of paper over and over, as if he had read it incorrectly, as if it said something different. Oh no, he said again, so faintly that it was as if he didn't even know he was speaking out loud. Without a word, Violet opened the door to the library, and the Baudelaire's took a step inside and found themselves shivering. The room was freezing cold, and after one glance, the orphans knew why. The wide window had shattered. Except for a few shards that still stuck to the window frame, the enormous pane of glass was gone, leaving a vacant hole that looked out into the still blackness of the night. The cold night air rushed through the hole, rattling the bookshelves and making the children shiver up against one another. But despite the cold, the orphans walked carefully to the empty space where the window had been and looked down. The night was so black that it seemed as if there was absolutely nothing beyond the window. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny stood there for a moment and remembered the fear they had felt just a few days ago when they were standing in this very same spot. They knew now that their fear had been rational. Huddling together, looking down into the blackness, the Baudelaire's knew that their plan to keep a careful watch had come too late. They had locked the barn door, but poor Aunt Josephine was already gone.